this group uh, through the, the Quran itself. Um, before we, we get into the, the topic for today, um, I'd also just want to make a few announcements about some of the other programs that we've had um, or, or that are upcoming. Um, so there's been a series also with uh, Sheikh Shamali. Um, so the second part of that uh, will be this Tuesday. So that's the 30th of June. Um, and that's on seeking knowledge from cradle to the grave. Um, we're also excited to announce that we will be doing a series on racism, which is obviously um, very apt with um, all, all of the sort of global events uh, happening in terms of Black Lives Matter and that sort of thing. Um, and so the details of that will be uh, sh like shared on the website and you'll be getting emails and things like that. But just as a quick heads up, uh, we'll have a range of speakers. So that includes Sheikh Noor Mohammed, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Hanif, uh, Sister Barak Hussein, uh, and Sheikh Jaffa Laduk. Um, so that's a, a four-part series, and we're starting uh, from the 12th of July. So that's going to be on uh, subsequent Sundays from the 12th of July at 7 p.m. Inshallah. And um, so do keep your eyes peeled uh, for the information on that, which will be on the IUS website, uh, which is www.ius.org.uk. Um, and also just a heads up again for next weekend, inshallah, we will be finishing off uh, this series with the, the fifth and the sixth uh, part um, with the, the esteemed, uh, say, Dr. Hassan al-Sadr. Um, and and, and then that will, will be part of our overall uh, online events, which I'm sure you guys have seen. this have been quite active over the coronavirus COVID uh, period and we'll, inshallah we'll be able to to continue bringing more online events uh, that are accessible and more convenient um, to yourself as well um so i'd uh, i do want to just briefly talk uh, a bit about just again for for people that maybe not not aware some of the wider activities that we've been doing with ius um they've been in the national emails but uh, over the period besides running online events like this one we'll be doing quite a few things internally about streamlining our processes um, working on some of our internal strategies and our structure um, and a big one was about setting our vision for the next few years and um, so we've, we've been refreshing our vision documentation and inshallah uh, that will be shared with you as a sort of a community over the next uh, week and um, so we're really open to, to getting feedback uh, and your input on that but equally in, in terms of us all trying to serve to empower the Muslim youth of the UK um, as a vision for our US uh, we're also looking for volunteers for people to come forward and help realize that vision so more details to be shared inshallah um, but i do hope to get some engagement uh, from yourselves on that um, and i'm sure you you've probably heard before but i'll just cover off uh, a quick bio for on said hassan um, i don't know if as in I, i've done this before about 10 years ago uh, in leeds uh, when we had said hassan Asada comes to uh, do some speeches with us before so it's been a while since i've chaired a program with them um, this team saved so i'm very excited and happy to be part of this and i uh, want to thank a lot of the the us national team who have sort of set up and propped up these events um so uh so hassan in terms of uh, background is a medical doctor he, he's currently based in london and a consultant uh, hematologist um there he's been very active i think throughout his life but in social activism um, and islamic activism and in particular, in terms of how faith can be a pivotal role in developing society. Um, he's been a dear patron, if you like, and supporter of IUS um, over the years. So we are very thankful and honored to have him continue his um, support and, and sharing his knowledge with us. Um, and a lot of his lectures tend to be focused on the, the rational and spiritual aspects around activism and with a very practical approach. Um, so we are indebted to him and uh, like I said, uh, we were very uh, honoured to, to have him uh, with us here again. Um, so in terms of the talk, inshallah, so the, um, the programme is that said Hassan will be doing a talk for around up to 30 minutes or so, and then there'll be a Q&A session afterwards. However, we do want it to be interactive. So there will be checkpoints, if you like, within within the, the, the talk. So do feel free to use the, the chat section that that's open to you. If you've got questions through from the start, feel free to also put them into the Q and A uh, section of uh, like a uh, Zoom. You'll have this, this should be accessible at the bottom, both whether you're using a phone or whether you are um, on a desktop. Um, so, uh, and 
yeah, like I said, we want it to be more than just a one-way conversation. And so it would be great to have people engaging over the microphone. We've, we've got Brother Monty who's moderating and stuff. So if you could raise your hand uh, via that, then that'll just flag and we can unmute you and, and have your um, contributions, inshallah. Um, and that way it means that I don't need to pick on people and start putting people on the spot. So hopefully we won't need to get to that. Um, but I think that's probably enough from me. So without further ado, I think I'll welcome Sayyid Hassan al-Sadr um, with a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين. Thank you very much, my dear brother Ayman, for the introduction, and I am thankful and grateful to Allah سبحانه وتعالى who has given me another opportunity to be with this amazing organization contributing, a very small contribution to the amazing work that the Islamic Union Society has done and will continue to do, inshallah. And one of its main activities is spreading knowledge, raising awareness, and empowering Muslims with their faith, with the tools, that they need to progress in life, inshallah. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope my voice is clear and the video is working and you can see the presentation. All perfect, thank you very much. Yeah, we can see um, and know what of mashallah. Allah, Allah, thank you very much. And thanks for the uh, encouragement from the uh, participants to interrupt me. Uh, whenever they, uh, they find it necessary to clarify um, the points, to hear from them, to have their, their viewpoints heard, inshallah, to enrich the discussion. I would like to, to take a few moments to pray for the success of this organization, for the tawfiq and the well-being of the participants, and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness for all our sins, all our shortcomings, and to take these very, very small steps that we take towards him, to take it as means, evidence of our willingness to follow his path and may he answer our prayers and, and get us closer and closer towards him, to fulfill our duties towards him and towards his chosen ones. We ask him also to bestow the blessings of, in what we do on the discussion that we have on spreading this knowledge that I have learned from teachers from the Islamic Seminary, from the Hawza, and here I am sharing it with my respected brothers and sisters, and I hope and I pray sincerely that they will not do the same, but do even better than this, implement the knowledge and spread it. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover our sins, to continue to bestow this veil, to hide our mistakes, our deficiencies, so that we can continue on the journey towards him. I have previously clarified that uh, the content of, of this series, the two topics, have been nothing but the 
documentation of previous lessons I attended. The first part, first topic, which was upon the existence of the creator, the rational approach, had been from lessons I attended under the supervision of Sheikh Hussain al Asadi. And the second topic, the special status for special people from the Quran are lessons I attended under the supervision of Sayyid Sam al Badri. We don't need outsiders. We have enough scholars, teachers to uh, teach us our faith and to take our hands, inshallah, on the straight path, to guide us on the straight path. At the beginning of the series, I did clarify also the importance of believers especially in this time, the modern time that we live in, to continue to revive and adhere to their paradigm. We use a God-centric lens to look at this world, to, to examine the existence that we are in. And this special lens, which other people around us may not share with us, they, would, they probably do have some of them, their own lenses. We have a God-centric lens, that's why we have a God-centric paradigm that we live by. And the two topics are very important. The first topic ad addressed the foundation of this paradigm, using a rational approach to prove the existence of the Creator and his main attributes, justice and life after death. And we concluded yesterday um, that topic. Second topic, the second part, is about the guides. Who is there to guide us to navigate through the details of this paradigm? The foundation set there, rationally, the Quran is the only holy book that matches the, the, the rational uh, foundations that we've established. Now we want to know the guides. Clearly, the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the mercy to mankind, was the last messenger, the final messenger. But what about after the Prophet? The question that we will try and address from the Quran, from the Quran only, over the next three parts of the program, is is there a special status for certain people after the Prophet? The religion of Islam, does it have such category? Now we know common knowledge that Islam speaks about prophets. And within the group of prophets, within the category of prophets, it has categories of messengers. Not every prophet is a messenger, but every messenger is a prophet and a messenger. So that's a clear category. These are guides, these are people chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver the message, to deliver the revelation and to guide people. The question is, in the religion of Islam, is there another special status? So prophets have special status, they receive revelation. Uh, and because of this knowledge, because of God's preparation for them, they have certain duties, they have certain rights, but they have certain duties. The duties are to lead, to guide. The question that we're trying to address is, within this religion, is there a second category? Is there a, a special status for another group of people, in addition to the messengers and the prophets? Commonly, this, uh, this question is just addressed using al-hadith, using the narrations, using the sunnah, using the prophet's traditions, his words, his actions, his approvals. And we have no doubt that this approach, this common approach of answering this question 
is valid. No one should be misguided to think that we are undermining using the Sunnah, the traditions of the Prophet, the Ahadith, to answer the question. We're not doing that at all. We're complementing. We're complementing the approach that people do take. Using the narrations will lead you to the certainty that yes, within the religion of Islam, there is such a, a category. There is a special st status for certain people after the Prophet. And we accept that and we believe in that. But to complement the certainty, we are using the Quran and the Quran alone, only to highlight to people the importance of such status, only to demonstrate to people that this pillar within our faith, this category of people do exist, not only in the narrations, but it, 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 they do also exist within the Holy Book. People haven't been aware of these verses, maybe. Um, it doesn't affect the, the reality. People have been aware of this, uh, of this reality, of the existence of these people through the narrations. Great. They've reached the ultimate goal. They've answered the question. However, we want to complement that conclusion, complement that certainty with examining the Quran and the Quran alone. And I've been careful in my choice of words. Um, I haven't really spoken, I haven't really mentioned the common words that are used when this topic is discussed. Maybe the audience uh, could help me at this uh, moment in time. What are the common words when we talk about you know, those people? the common discussion between Muslims. You know, he's probably talking about the Imams, the Khulafa, the successors. On purpose, I haven't used these words. Why? Because I want to highlight to you um, starting from the Quran, what conclusions can we make? even before we get to uh, these titles of Khulafa and of Imams. Uh, the Quran uh, uses slight different terminology, different attributes, different descriptions. And please, again, just like uh, our respected chairman, uh, clarify, please stop me at any point if something's not clear or if you want to you have a comment or a, or, a, or a point to make. The Quran, has used certain vocabulary when he talks about those people, and you will you will see how you know, this is revelation. You see how how careful the choice of words and how each word leads you to to know a trait, a description of those people. Very very beautiful description. Um, the second reason why I haven't mentioned the words imma or khulafa is because commonly, commonly people. Have an, have, have an association that they make with this topic. They think it's politics. They think people who address this issue are talking about political struggle. You know, the word Khalifa or Imam are commonly uh, understood as you know, political terms, political positions. Indeed, one of the duties of those selected pe uh, group of people was to succeed the prophet politically. But that's not the whole story. That's not, you know, their ultimate uh, role. If we think of their ultimate role as being mainly or purely political, then Many Muslims would find this discussion not so, not so 
relevant to modern world. Okay, so maybe they're talking about a political issue that, you know, took place 1,400 years ago. Why is this relevant now? Can't we face, can't, can't we focus on the challenges that we're facing today? So specifically, I chose not to use these words, even though we are talking about this group of people, this respected group of people, uh, is to take people, just to bring people back to the reality, to their to their special status in accordance with the Quran and the politics and political duties and political successorship of the Prophet is just one element, one aspect of their duties. Their main role is religious guidance. And our religion encompasses everything. Politics is a part, is part of it. But when there is, you know, there isn't public support, the prophet or the messenger can't exercise his duties politically. That doesn't take anything away from him. It's his right. It's the duty of the people to support him politically to implement change. But if they don't, if people don't fulfill their duties, and that divinely chosen man, prophet, the messenger, or the imam, uh, has his other role to play. Obviously, the people have not fulfilled their duties, but he still has a role to guide people. So it's guidance. It's what we need today. It's details. It's answers to our questions. Questions that, that we need so, so dearly today. Questions about how do we fix this world? What are the answers to our problems? Do we get together as people and and try and form political entities and form global institutions, United Nations, the United Nations form different bodies and different categories. And, and what do we do then? How do we solve our problems? Has the world, the current world order, the system that we've worked so hard to implement, you know, the accumulation of experience of generations till the events of the Second World War when this current world order started to shape, to take shape. Have we succeeded? Are we bridging the gap between the rich and the poor using the current system? Are we helping countries or are we putting them more and more into debt? Are we spreading education? Are we fighting the disease in the right way? When there is an, a pandemic, a global pandemic, are we working together? together to face this or are we as nations you know stealing from each other what are the answers of our to our problems we need answers we've tried being self-centric person-centric and we failed we have definitely failed but just recovering from a very recent economic meltdown in 2007 2008 and Another one is, has started already, not because of COVID-19. COVID-19 accelerated the process. Economists have been uh, warning people from that 2020, 2021, they will start another economical meltdown in the world with thousands of jobs and lives and, uh, at risk. So we need answers. So answer the question of who are these guides? Do they exist? Is there a special status? Is still a very relevant topic to discuss. So, Bismillah. Let's start with the first verse. This is this is a beautiful verse that, inshallah, you will add to your collection. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, you know, verses in Surah Al-Ahzab that talks about Ahl al-Bayt, Surah Al-Ma'idah that talks about the Wilaya. Um, inshallah, you will add this one to your collection. Chapter 35, Surah Fatr, the originator. 
أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان اللعين الرجيم. And the first verse, verse 31, inshallah you can all see it on the screen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the screen clear, the, the font size. Yeah, that's perfect. That's fine. Thank you, Sayyid. Thank you. So in verse 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the revelation of the book. Which we have revealed to you of the book. Indeed, it is the truth and nothing but the truth. The word book in the, in the Quran is used in more than one uh, place. Uh, the meaning here, the meaning that we can deduct from the verse is that it, it's the religion. Our religion is formed of um, the sources of the teachings of our religion are the book and the traditions of the prophets. Um, Al-Quran al-Kareem was sunnah So it's all al-kitab, al-deen, the religion. So Allah, in the first verse, 31, says he has revealed the book to you, to you, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Very clear. And if someone has a different understanding, please share it with, with us. Examine the second verse, verse 32, and I have just underlined the important descriptions. Allah then says, Thumma. So after we have revealed the book to you, revealed the religion to you, and it is the truth, then. So this is a process after the revelation to the Prophet. So the Prophet is the Prophet, the Messenger. And then after we have revealed the whole religion to you, or Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi, then another process took place. Awrathna. Wiratha is inherited, inheritance. After we have revealed the religion to you, we have given the book, the religion. kitab. We have given the book as inheritance. Inheritance something that is given exclusively to a group of people. We have given the book, the religion, i.e. The, the knowledge, special knowledge. There's obviously common knowledge about the religion that the Prophet delivered to everyone. And there is special knowledge knowledge that other people didn't need at the time, or more detailed answers of what people learned at the time. Ultimately, it is special knowledge of the religion, exclusive knowledge. It was given as inheritance, wirathe. It was given as inheritance to the chosen amongst our servants. Thumma, after the revelation. Thumma, this is within the religion of Islam. The book, the religion, special knowledge was given as inheritance to a chosen group of people. Not just chosen, istifa, you know, istifa. Amongst our servants. Is everyone clear about? And we haven't even started. <laughs> and you can you can easily see that within the religion of Islam there exists a category of people who have special knowledge, chosen. And the third trait is, is about to come. Is, is that point clear before we proceed with the verse? Because the verse then gives an, an elaboration why this process was, was, uh, has taken place. Does anyone have any questions at, at this stage? 
about the existence of a special category, special group of people within the religion of Islam. Maybe me say it, and and I'm sure you're probably going to come to it. So maybe I'm getting ahead of uh, myself. Um, no, is that how we how we define who those people are, are as in are chosen? Because obviously. Uh, I think where we're going to get to is that we talk about the Ahlul Bayt and Islam, but then automatically my mind is thinking that we've got the NBR and the Mursali, and we have uh, wise people like Khadr salam, who's commonly understood as a, a wise person who had been bespo- bestowed specific knowledge, but wasn't necessarily a prophet. Um, so maybe this is where we're going, and I'm trying to jump ahead. <laughs> Inshallah, indeed. So... Uh... Just, just to clarify, thank you very much, Aaron, for that. We're talking about within the religion of Islam, right? So there will be no prophets after the prophet of Islam. This is a process that took place after the revelation was given to the prophet. Because the first verse speaks about re- revealing the book, revealing the religion to the prophet, right? So this is thumma, then. So this is within the religion of Islam. We know that the prophet is the seal of the prophets. Well, we know prophets are messengers after him. So all the respected prophets, messengers, and khawar, you know, all these were there before the prophets. This is now after the prophets. With the prophet, but they will be there after the prophet. Mm-hmm. And we'll come to show what their relationship to the prophet will be. Okay. Well, and, th- and say, just before we continue, I think we've got a, a, a comment from uh, Sister yes. Yasmin. Uh, she's got her hand raised. So if you if you can just unmute uh, Sister Yasmin to, to comment. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to quickly ask um, <clears throat> when you um, said that the word d- uh, used is astafaina um, and w- that it had some special significance um, and it's not just a matter of chosen. Um, I was wondering if you could expand into the significance of that particular word. Thank you very much. Um, so, so chosen in Arabic could have been uh, the Quran. Allah Subhanahu could have used the word ikhtar. You know, we know that the Prophet is one of his names is al-Mukhtar. So you have, you know, a few options, and you takhtar ahaduhum. You choose one of them. Istifa gives it that. The meaning of istifa gives it that uh, dimension of the best amongst them. Right, and istifa is also has it has a dimension of the best, and it's 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 something that the chosen the chosen one the chosen group is taken with special status with relation to the one making the istifa, the one making the choice. So it's slightly higher level of just choosing, which is ikhtiyar. You could have an ikhtiyar, you could have an istifa. So istifa gives it that just extra dimension. Um, the rest of the verse gives an explanation why this process took place. Why was the book, after it was revealed to the Prophet, not just the Quran, the whole teachings of, of the religion, after they were revealed to the Prophet, why was it given as inheritance? to a special group amongst the servants that they were chosen, Mustafaun. Why? Faminhum. Minhum is not referring to the chosen group of people. Minhum is is referring to the word, our servants. We're all the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, faminhum zalimun linafsih. Minhum, it starts to to, to explain to people why this process took place? Because amongst the servants, at the time of the Prophet, uh, for a, for the time, there were three groups. Minhum, min ibadina. Zalimun linafsih, the group that wrongs themselves. Insan yadlan nafsih. Um, we wrong ourselves. We choose to do the wrong things, and the consequences are on us. 
اقتصاد is قصد is, is trying to be on the straight path so not someone who has wronged himself or herself is the second group مقتصد people who are trying to be good and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us to be amongst those who are trying to be good trying to follow al-qasd which is the straight path so first group Amongst the servants, they don't deserve to inherit the special knowledge. They've received the knowledge like everyone else did from the Prophet. If they ask a question, the Prophet would have answered them. Second group, they're trying to be good, but they don't deserve that exclusive knowledge. The third group does, which is the last category. The third group, they are in the foremost of good deeds. They are ahead of everyone else. They're not trying to be good. They are ahead of everyone else. They are ahead in purity. They are ahead in taqwa. They are ahead in all khayrat. They're not in that process of, you know, like me. One day, I receive a strong reminder, I'm on the straight path. Spiritually, I'm elevated. The other day, I follow my desires, I surrender my will to the, uh, to the nafs, that's Ammar Amsu, to Iblis, you know, trying. No, they are there, ahead of everyone else. So the explanation of why the book was given as inheritance to a special category is because some are valimina and fusihim, some are trying to be good, but the third group, the third category, the purified ones, right? The purified ones, those who are, you know, they're there. They're not in the process of struggle. They are ahead of everyone else. وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْكَبِيرُ this is the great father from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Greatest blessing. So from this verse, from the two verses, especially verse number 32, we can conclude that after the Prophet of Islam, a group of people, we don't know who they are yet, right? We are trying to establish the principle. Is there a category within Islam within this religion, just like we know about prophets and messengers, we know about angels who have certain duties. One of them is to have the revelation communicated from Allah to the prophets, to the messengers. We have all these categories. Is there another category now from the Quran of inheritors? Remember the first slide, or when you receive the, the invitation to join this program. The inheritors, al warithin Is there a group of inheritors who have inherited special knowledge about this religion? Obviously chosen by Allah and purified. They've been, there was astifa that took place. They were chosen because they were the best. They're not struggling, they're not struggling, they're trying to be good. They are the best. So there is such a category. It does exist. Any Muslim who examines the Quran carefully should be asking himself or herself the question if this group of people do exist and they have access to special knowledge, they're purified, they're chosen, who are they? Who are they? I need to learn from those who have access to special knowledge. They have inherited the teachings of the Prophet. They were Obviously the Prophet taught everyone as much as they wanted to, to understand, to know about Islam, right? But we want more details, we want answers to our current challenges. Let's look for the inheritors, the chosen inheritors, the divinely chosen inheritors who are the foremost in all good deeds. 
they were there at the time of the Prophet, and they still must exist. Before I proceed any further with examining any verses, and I think I'm coming to my 30 minutes, uh, please, Ayman, I do request from you to stop me if I've, uh, if I've used the, the time uh, allocated to me. Before I proceed any further, I just want to say one thing. Historically, historically, none of the companions, none of the people around the Prophet claimed that they had special status, except Ahlul Bayt, except Ali ibn Abi Talib. Before we proceed any further, I know, I know in our methodology we're using the Quran, the Quran alone, but I know some people are asking themselves now, well, it's a special status, but maybe they were amongst the companions. Historically, none of the companions made that claim. You can examine history and you'll come to this conclusion. No one did that, except Ali ibn Abi He said, I have a special status. Um, but we're not using uh, traditions. We're not using a hadith. We're focusing, focusing on the Quran. So before I move on to the second verse that would, that would uh, make it clearer, uh, if I have time, does anyone have any question about this very important verse that sets the foundation for this special status? Any comments from anyone from the audience? And just regarding time, say, just maybe while people are thinking. Um, I think, yeah, we're fine for time, so don't, don't worry about that because we're almost, especially if we're doing questions and comments throughout, um, so don't feel limited to think. Uh, we'll move on to the next verse and, and sort of give it its... Uh, Inshallah. Uh, Thank you very much. So is there any, any other comments of, uh, from anyone that'd like to raise their hand or either put in the chat? So reading this verse now, carefully examining it, everyone believes that there is a category within the religion of Islam that after the Prophet, there was a divinely chosen group of inheritors who inherited the knowledge of the Prophet, that's the deen. Yeah? Okay. Now, let's examine another verse. This is now chapter 11, Surah Hud, one of the prophets who's buried in Najaf, not far away from the shrine of Ali ibn Abi Talib Hud wa Salih, both are buried not far away from the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen. We have in our heritage that Adam, and Nuh, these two great prophets, are buried right next to where Ali ibn Abi Talib is buried, so very, very close to him, and just outside, obviously, I'm talking modern work, in, in, in the current, uh, uh, current location, the shrine, you come out of the shrine, you go to the uh, beginning of the maqbara, uh, of Wadi Salam, um, the graveyard, and you will come to the shrine of Hud wa Salih. So this is Prophet Hud. So Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse 17. Um, there is a common phrase in the Quran to describe the prophets. And after today's lesson, I want you to go and just Type these search, these search words within the Quran. Uh, when several prophets they say, and I have clear proof from my Lord. Bayina is the clear proof. So, not just the Prophet of Islam, but few prophets are described in the Quran in their conversation, dialogue with their people, they say, I have a clear proof from my Lord. Okay, I have a clear proof from my Lord. 
على بينة من ربي. This verse is talking about the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله. Also, having a clear proof from his Lord. Um, and we know that this is the Prophet of Islam. Why? Because there are quite a few prophets that were described, with, that were given this description, that they describe themselves as having a clear proof of their words. In this verse, the one who has a clear proof from his Lord. lived after Musa. So I'm not talking about the prophets before Musa because it says, وَمِنْ قَبْلِهِ كِتَابُ مُوسَى So this one, this prophet who has the clear proof from his Lord is a prophet that lived after Musa. Okay? Um, and it's the prophet of Islam because the, the warning that um, the end of the verse contains for those who don't believe in him are, are clearly stated there. ومن يكفر به من الأحزاب فالنار موعده. Whoever disbelieves in him, disbelieves as seeing the truth and rejects it, hides it, فالنار موعده. Okay. So the one who has a clear proof from his Lord in this verse is Prophet Muhammad صلى الله is he then who has with him a clear proof from his Lord? This is the Prophet of Islam. Came after Musa, and there is a special warning to those who don't believe in him. Now, pay attention to the underlined, to the word underline, shahidun min. Shahidun min. Now we have to be very careful. We have to. I'm relying that some of you have some understanding of the Arabic language. And if you don't, I will, inshallah, try my best to examine the possibilities of these three words. That after the one who has a clear proof from his Lord. يَتْلُوهُ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ Shahid, the word in, in red, witness. The third word in red, witness. The witness is someone who has access to special knowledge. Maybe some people have the understanding that the witness is someone who was there when the incidents took place when the event took place. Yes, but not exclusively. You could be a witness, even though you weren't there exactly when the event took place. And I will, next screen, I'll show you a verse from the Quran. And it's, it's, it's quite obvious what I, what the, 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 the way I am uh, clarifying what the witness, you know, what is the meaning of the witness, but I'll show you a verse. But you don't have to be there. But if you have access to special knowledge, then you are a witness. Exclusive knowledge. That's why they rely on you. They bring you to court because you have access to special knowledge. Maybe that special knowledge is because you were there or to clarify the truth. So after the one who has a clear proof from his Lord, a witness... Min, the witness, I'm skipping the word yatlu because it's commonly mistranslated. I'll come back to it in a minute. Shahid is the second word. Witness, access to special knowledge. Min, the witness has a relationship with the one who has a clear proof from his Lord. Min is from him. Min from him. The shahid, the witness, is from the one who has a clear proof 
from his Lord. There is a special relationship between the witness and the one who has clear proof on his own. He is from him. Now let's go back to the first word, which is commonly mistranslated, yet lu. It's commonly mistranslated, I'll put it in italic there. A witness from him recites it, like tilawa. Tilawa is to recite. So commonly mistranslated as recites it. So the translation of, the, of, of this verse is commonly presented as, uh, who has with him a clear proof from his Lord and a witness from him recites it. Recites what? The proof? The proof? What does this witness, what does he recite? If you think his special action, the special uh, thing that he does is to recite the um, the proof, and I just want to draw your attention to something in Arabic. Uh, you know in Arabic there's mudakkar and mu'annif. Is that clear to the audience what, what I'm talking about? In the masculine and feminine. That's right. Bayyina is a feminine description. Bayyina. Okay. So if the, if the witness, if the correct understanding of the word yetlu is to recite it, it should have been, should have been yetlu ha. He recites it with a feminine description. Yetlu ha shahidun min. Not yetlu. Yetlu is masculine. Bayyina is a feminine word. So it can't be recited. What's the other possible explanation of the word yetlu? Either recitation, to recite, but there's a feminine word there, it should have been yetluha, but it's clearly stated as yetlu. The second explanation is, comes after him. Yetlu. You're all familiar with the word, with the verse, was shamsi wa buhaha wal qamari ida talaha. The shams, the sun, with its buha, which is the, the early morning light, and the qamar comes after it. The moon, talaha, yetlu, comes after the sun. So this, the, the second possible meaning, which is the true meaning, is that the witness comes after the one who has clear proof from his Lord. So the appropriate translation of the verse is, is he then who has with him a clear proof from his Lord and a witness from him comes after him. So essentially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is laying ways in which you know that this religion is the truth. You have the witness. So you have the one who has clear proof from his Lord. You have the witness, who has special access to knowledge. You have the book of Musa. The book of Musa, the Torah, the Old Testament, has, it is a treasure of knowledge to guide you to the straight path if you study it and examine it correctly. This all should lead you to the conclusion that this religion is the truth. So now we have an elaboration to build on from the previous verse that amongst the group of the inheritors, amongst them, one of them at least, has a special relationship with the prophet. He's, he comes from him. He's from him. He has a special relationship. And He's a witness because he has access to special knowledge because he, was, he is amongst the inheritors, the chosen ones, the divinely chosen ones who are sabiqeen, 
سابقون بالخيرات they are you know ahead of everyone else so the first of them the first amongst them is the witness who comes after the prophet and he's related to the prophet he comes from the prophet and if you want uh, an, an, uh, an example from the quran that the word witness uh, speaks about special knowledge then this is surah al-anbiya this is the last verse i will share with you uh, this afternoon surah al-anbiya the prophets chapter 21 verse 56 this is ibrahim alayhi salam i think it's prophet ibrahim alayhi salam if i'm not mistaken he speaks to the people about their Lord. He says, your Lord um, is the one who created Fatar as created heavens and earth. He brought them into existence. And I am of those who bear witness to this. The prophet here is labeling himself as a witness that Allah has brought heavens and earth to existence. Not that the Prophet was there. Obviously, the creation was before the time of the Prophet. He wasn't living there during that time. He wasn't alive at that time. But he bears witness because he testifies that this is what Allah has done, because he has access to special knowledge, that he becomes a witness because he has this knowledge. So I will stop here. We've examined two verses, Surah Fatir, Surah Hud, and we know that there's a special category of people who exist. And the first of them, someone who comes straight after the Prophet, who's a witness, who's amongst the divinely chosen inheritors. Alhamdulillah,